That makes it a French recording, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. There you go. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I get to today introduce our speaker, uh, Kristen Nelson, uh, MAMTBC, who is an instructional professor and coordinator of clinical activities in music therapy at the University of Iowa School of Music. Professor Nelson's clinical work most recently focuses on pediatric medical inpatients at the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital, where she worked as a music therapist for nearly 20 years. <clears throat> Within the Children's Hospital, her special interests include children with cancer, pediatric pain management, and pedi pediatric palliative care. She received the 2013 Clinician-Based Research Award from the American Music Therapy Association for her investigation of the analgesic properties of music-assisted relaxation with adolescent surgical patients. Before working at the university hospitals, Professor Nelson created the music therapy program at West Music Company, where she served as director of music therapy for eight years. She developed, promoted, and provided contractual music therapy services to the community and worked with a wide variety of children and adults in both group and individual settings. Uh, I'm kind of stoked to hear what she has to say. Uh, thank you for being here with us, Professor Nelson. Thank you so much. It is just wonderful to be here. And I love the banter and the... Um, the, the way that you all know each other and, and you're comfortable talking with each other because I was a little nervous about talking to you and now I feel very much more at ease. Um, and I, I really prefer in person, but I see the benefits of Zoom. And so I'm so thankful that you're all here. Um, I really like to know my group. Um, and I feel like I do know a little bit now about who likes peas and who doesn't and who plays saxophone, but maybe if we could just, if you wouldn't mind, if you feel comfortable, just unmuting briefly and just uh, name and um, what library system you're you're in or which library you serve, if that makes sense, kind of what your role is. Um, and then maybe um, a preferred style of music or, uh, or artist that you like. Um, do you okay. want to do popcorn style since, oh, you know, yeah. we don't all, I mean, just point to somebody and then we'll just name the next person, I guess. Exactly. So let's start with Maddie. I was on Maddie. Okay. So I work at the, um, I work, my name is Maddie. I work at the library's annex. Um, it's an offsite storage facility for the libraries. So we have stuff from all the different branches. Um, I like a lot of different music, but I think more recently I've been listening to a lot of like rap and hip hop more so but I was like kind of raised with like Elvis and the Beatles and things like that so it's, it's a very wide wide range and I'll uh popcorn over to Lauren haha -ha. let me put my microphone down I am a cataloger at Maine and I also listen to a lot of different kinds of music from rap to hip-hop to rock to country and I, funnily enough, I just ordered a music book of um, Elvis for the keyboard. So that's funny you said that. So I'm a little bit all over the place. You want to call somebody to go next, Lauren? Oh, yes, I do. I popcorn Kathy. Um. I'm a cataloger uh, in the main library, and um, I like a lot of different types of music, um, but my main fallback is folk music, and I grew up listening to it. Um, I like the stories. Um, I like the ballad style. Um, I don't know. It's just what, I, what I'm really tuned into. Uh, uh, Young Hung. Young Hung is either muted or away from keyboard at the moment, so. I will uh, choose someone else. Um, how about Lori Cullen? Okay, I work in cataloging in the main library, as all of you know. Um, music, 
Where do I start? Everything since I started recording music. Bessie Smith, Sister Rosetta Tharp, uh, The Kingman, The Beach Boys, you uh, too. Need I go on? <laughs> <laughs> eclectic, eclectic. Let's put it that way, eclectic. <laughs> Beautiful. And I want to say, uh, Young Hong did make a, a, a put a statement in the chat. So thank you for that. All right. From Lori. Should we go to Sherry, maybe? I did say Sherry, but I was still muted when I said it. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Sherry. I work in um, cataloging the main library. Um, I work with Institutional Repository. Esplora was otherwise known. Um, music. I don't know. I kind of listen to all kinds. I tend to have Pandora up a lot. Um, when I'm working. Um, I listen to like Jason Gray, like inspirational, like Christian contemporary a lot. I like classical piano and classical guitar sometimes. It kind of depend depends on my mood. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, who should go next? Um, let's see, Christine Bellamy, have you gone? I put it in the chat. Yeah, I was going to say, Christina has a blurb in the chat. Oh, yes. I knew I recognized your name. Wonderful. Former student is music therapist and you're in cataloging. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, has Lauren gone? No, yes. Yes, Lauren's gone. Uh, Shannon? Hi, I'm Shannon. I work in interlibrary loan. I listen to just about any kind of music. I'm all over the place. Usually just have it on random. Or, um, and I was interested in this because I kept seeing music therapy books come through interlibrary loan and I wanted to know more about it. So oh. uh, let, <clears throat> let's go to uh, Yoshi next. <laughs> Hi, I'm Yoshi, the Japanese studies librarian. Um, uh, I like pop music, uh, including Japanese pop music and uh, jazz, uh, classic. Actually, I, I like all kinds of music. Thank you. Hmm. How about Carlette? <clears throat> Hello. Hey. Hey. Great. Can you repeat the question? I was not. Oh, just your name. What what part of the library system you're in, and um, just a, maybe a favorite style of music or something you'd like to listen to. Uh, my name is Carlette Washington Hoagland. Um, I'm the coordinator of staff development and diversity programming, which is why you received the initial emails from both Maddie and I. Um. I, I love a lot of music. I grew up on Christian music in the South, um, jazz, blues. And when I was in high school, I started to listen to um, pop, pop and rock music. And now I listen to everything. <laughs> I just love music. Fantastic. I think that leaves Jean. Last but not least. I think that Connie and Chris need to go too. Okay. Microphone. Oh, yeah, Lisa. Yeah, Lisa. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. Chris, sorry. Talked to you at the beginning. Ten second. All right. Let's go to Chris. Um, I'm Chris Clark. I work in library IT, mostly in the main library. And um, I listen to a lot of early country and early jazz, um, bluegrass, and a lot of roots music or pre-war stuff is where I tend to gravitate. Who would you like to oh, go next? Oh, uh, Lisa, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm Lisa Martinsick, and I work in electronic resources up on the fifth floor of main library. Uh, I like lots of kinds of music, 
Um, like I'm over the moon that Nico Case is coming to town soon for Mission Creek. She's one of my favorites, but I also love like funk, electronica, industrial punk, um, lots of stuff. And I grew up with polka every <laughs> Sunday on the radio because um, that my parents were really, really big into polka. Um, yeah. And Connie, surprise. <laughs> So I'm uh, Connie Wade. I work here at the main library with public services. Um, like so many of us here, I echo that all sorts of music. It's probably um, that I'd listen to. What drew me to this session was I had someone um, that I'd love at the hospital have some pretty serious surgery and they had music therapy come to the room and it was amazing the impact they that that experience had on the recovery. So I wanted to say that, and um, it's it's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Connie. I appreciate that. We've had a couple other people join. Um, Grant or Melina, we're, we're just sharing just your name, what part of the library you're in, and if there's a favorite style of music you have or something that drew you to the session. Melina's still getting connected. Okay. Grant, do you have anything you want to share? Oh, yeah. Feel free to add to the chat too. That's that's cool. Super. Thank you all. I know that took a little time. And I really appreciate it because I think first of all, it gets you thinking about music. And it also um gives me an idea of of what you listen to and and the eclectic nature that a lot of you talked about. I think it's very common now because I believe that streaming has opened people's minds, you know, and I've been a music therapist for 35 years. And when I first started, I literally had a, a case, a, a big cart that had LPs and a turntable. And that's how I provided music. Then I went to the mixtapes, never used eight track in my work, then went to the CDs, learned how to burn CDs, would make CDs for people, all that. And now we're into streaming. And it's very interesting because my question of, and what radio station do you listen to? How I would sort of find out what kids were listening to or who, what people were enjoying is, is kind of a moot point anymore. Um, what's on your playlist? I'll ask them oftentimes, or, you know, who are you, who you've been streaming lately, but because it links them to other artists, I find that people are really enjoying a lot of different styles. I think that's a great thing. Yeah. So thank you all very much. And I bet some of you are at the Nickel Creek concert. Uh, that I went to on Tuesday night. That was really something. Some of you folk uh, roots people. That was really quite a show. And yes, Hancher is just so diverse uh, in, in the artists that they're bringing this year. Love, love their programming. All right. I'm going to share some slides, um, you know, to keep me on track. And uh, I think this will get us. Let me look here. Let me do this. Give me just a second. Okay, everybody see that okay? Okay, great. So now I can't see the chat. So um, Maddie or Lisa or whoever's gonna kind of moderate, please feel free to, um, to interrupt, to jump in. Let me know if people have questions I need to address. I'll try to stop kind of between each section. So today I'm going to be talking about an introduction to music therapy, research and clinical applications. And um, I, so just to, uh, to kind of add to my bio, so I served uh, the university hospitals for the last 20 years, and I am still on staff there, PRN, so I go fill in when I'm not on contract teaching. Um, I'm, it was three years ago now that I joined the faculty at the School of Music for our, um, our academic program, and this was a really big shift for me. Probably bigger shift than I thought it was going to be. And I will tell you all honestly that in finishing my master's degree at age 50 and at moving into this libraries, online library stuff scares me a lot. And that was like one of the biggest hurdles for me when I went back to school. I was like, oh, I need a card catalog. I want to see all this stuff. I want to touch it all, you know? So kudos to all of you for everything that you go through and all the ways that you are bringing um, students into this new way of learning. It is amazing what's at their fingertips now. And, um, and my fear is decreasing with all of that. So 
Today, we're going to talk about a few different things. Um, and we're going to start by talking about music, because I think it's really difficult for you to understand how music is used therapeutically if we're not also addressing what it is about music, the tool that we're using. After we talk about music, we'll talk about the field of music therapy, what it is, give you some definitions, some information about training, and then I'll go into some clinical applications um, tied to research. So uh, I have uh, our lead TA and um, PhD student Sunju Lee joining us around 2.30 she plans to speak for about 15 minutes about her work with adults with Parkinson's disease and um, her use of neurologic music therapy. My background, you'll see, is quite a bit uh, with children, but I will make um, I will make generalizations for other groups as well. Okay, so that's kind of the plan. So first of all, why music? Why do we use music as a tool to address needs? Well. Music affects us in many different ways. One of the first ways that we're affected by music is physiologically. And so music is hardwired into our brain or sound and music to get us to uh, attend to basic acoustic characteristics. So think of the startle, right, to loudness. Our heart rates and our blood pressures increase and decrease along with tempo and stimulation of music. Um, music can calm us and music can activate us. And this is physically that it can do it. So humans also often entrain to rhythm. So rhythmic coordination can make physical work and motor coordination more efficient and more pleasant. So how many of you exercise to music or have music on when you walk, right? Or I know I turn it on when I've got to clean the house or something like that. I need to get a pick me up. I need to get myself going. But particularly when you use it with, with exercise, I find I have to have a certain beat per minute because I have to be with the rhythm of the music. That's just really important for me. Um, so we know now that music is processed throughout the brain. We used to think it was just on one side because of the creativity of it, but we know now that it's a whole brain workout. And rhythm is processed in the same area of the brain as um, as motor. So it's it's has this crossover, has this carryover. So that's why we see these responses. We also have emotional responses to music. So we all know this. You can think of that song, right, from high school uh, or that song with a special person in your life, your parents, your partner, your children, a certain song that just comes on and and you feel verklempt, right? You feel a little emotional. Um, and uh, that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have emotional responses to music. And that's one of the things that we base our work on. So people feel emotions when listening to music. And in some ways, I think that is the key. Uh, one of the major keys to using music as a tool for health and wellness and for therapy. Our emotional responses to music are often unconscious and immediate. So, uh, Oftentimes you can't even really prepare yourself when that song, com that song comes on and you're flooded with memories and you have these emotions that rise in you. Memories, cultural expectations, and context are also associated with the music that makes each listener's experience unique. So think of all the different styles of music that you identified when you were introducing yourselves. Um, we all have different memories associated with music. We all have different experiences associated with music. And the cultural piece is, you know, if you hear da, 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 right, we automatically go to the context of graduation. There are certain songs that just pull us into a very specific place and time. We also have music of many different cultures, and those different cultures are represented through the way that their music um, uh is represented and 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 in many ways their music is is unique to their culture and so what we grow up with we tend to feel the most familiar with and therefore the most comfortable with so when we think about music and emotion and the brain response um, we actually have some studies now that look at this so when i first started in this career we just had to say you know what I believe this is happening. And we now have MRIs that we can look at and we can see what's happening with blood flow. And so Blood and Zator did a study back in 2001 where they looked at emotional responses to music and they looked at what was happening in the brain and they found that when people found the music that gave them chills. So this 
has been further defined by a more recent study that just came out in 2023 as it tends to be songs that are represent longing or sadness or um, the angsty songs, right, that we love, that give us chills. This actually causes an increase in cerebral blood flow to certain regions, the ones that are associated with reward, motivation, emotion, and arousal. So we see that music affects the amygdala, which is kind of the, um, the emotional center of our brain. And this is where, as I'll talk about in a little bit, we run into this emotional component of pain management. So just a brief reminder about how kind of the autonomic nervous system works. We have the HPA axis. So we have the brain working with the pituitary, getting all that adrenaline out in our system. This is an, one of those automatic responses that I was talking about that we don't have a lot of control over. And we think about this now when we're thinking about the, um, the effects that stress have on our body um, and then the effect that music can have. So we have the sympathetic and high, and um, we have the sympathetic nervous system that of course can get uh, ramped up or slow us back down. And so we have these automatic systems working. Music can calm the autonomic nervous system, can decrease perceived stress, decrease stress hormones and cortisol, decrease the reactivity of our cardiovascular system. So there we see that blood pressure and we see the heart rate come down, increase endorphins, and it can actually improve our immune function. So music just on its own is having these effects on us. Um, how does this affect people in everyday life? Uh, interesting study by um, Botham and Sloda. Uh, they were looking at the functions of music for emotion regulation in everyday life. And so what they were looking at was every day, what, how are people using music? How are they regulating mu their moods? And, and uh, what are they doing? And they found that typically people used music to make positive changes. So they used music to help themselves feel better, or as I was saying, get energy to be able to work out or get the jobs done that they need to do. Um, so they had over 500 listening episodes and they found that 77% of them, um, individuals are using the music for affect regulation. 56.4% um, were purposeful use of music. Uh, and 75% of the episodes regulated positive mood shift. So happy, excited, calm, relaxed, positive, awake, attention, change from anger to a, a calmer state. So what this tells me is people are using music. And so oh, I'm having trouble forwarding there. So then we look at how do we then use music in a therapeutic way and purposefully and intentionally for that reason. Okay. I see there's a couple chats. Do I need to stop and check that? Now are we good? Anybody have any questions at the end of that section before we move into music therapy? Because I'm not able to see the chat. No, it looks like we're good. Okay. People are just sharing songs that affect them strongly. Ah, I want to see that. <laughs> okay. Well, so far, it's Fast Car by Tracy Chapman and it's oh. 17 by Janice Ian, which, I... wow. Yes. Appreciate that. Yes. Fast cars had this resurgence after the Grammys, right? Was it, uh, was it Luke Combs performed with Tracy Chapman? I think that's how that was. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So what is music therapy? So music therapy is a clinical and evidence base of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals in a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who's completed an approved music therapy program. So if we take that and kind of break it down, clinical and evidence-based, I don't have to tell you what evidence-based is. <laughs> this is where we're using the best available research. We're using our clinical wisdom and expertise combined with our clients' needs, values, and preferences to make decisions about what we're doing to improve their outcomes. We use music. So we already talked to you about why, why music is important. We use musical interventions. So we may songwrite may work with people to compose beats or to compose music of their own, but many times we're helping them put words into songs. Um, sometimes this is simplified for people by taking a familiar song, a preferred song, and taking out words and having them fill in new words. 
Sometimes it is creating a song from scratch. Sometimes it's us composing songs that are going to help individuals remember or, um, or be able to acquire the skills that they're working on. So if we're working with an individual, for example, with a, a brain injury and they're relearning how to dress themselves, we might create a song that sequences basic steps. And the song can be used as a mnemonic tool uh, or a way to remember the sequence because the music can help that learning. Um, we also use singing. So you can see my client there in the center. Singing is a very... Um, it's good for so many reasons and Sunju will tell you much more about it. But for this client, it did a lot to increase breath control, breath support, to um, allow expression, to engage in a socially pleasing um, environment with others. We also have people playing music and we play music. We teach therapeutic lessons if that's what's needed. We uh, bring in lots of different music, um, drums, uh, guitars, Ukuleles. I just worked with ukuleles with the students this morning. Um, chimes. <laughs> That's funny. My clock is ringing at the same time. Chimes, tone chimes, bells, different types of instruments that they can play hand percussion. And in that way, we might recreate songs um, that they've already heard and that they already like. Lean on me, classic. Everyone loves lean on me and great things for us to talk about for support system, as well as it's a great three chord, four chord song that we can perform easily with a group. And then there's listening to music. And many times we're working with people about how they're listening to music, how they're using music to support the healthy behaviors that they want to develop um, and helping create playlists for increased activation or relaxation, whatever it is we're working on. To work on individualized goals. Okay, I was already talking about that a little bit. So we're basically working on improving, maintaining, or decreasing certain behaviors. And the domains that we're looking at um, are, I think I might have that on the next slide. Let me see. We're looking at lots of different domains of function or skills where we can uh, meet those clients' needs depending on what they individually are. There it is. So physical needs, gross and fine motor coordination, strength. Think about individuals who are maybe in a long-term, um, uh, excuse me, a, a long-term facility maybe for older adults. They're not getting as much activity. So we might be able to integrate some movement into music to help with that. Cognitive, so there we're working on different memory, attention, on-task behaviors, different things like that. Emotional, we might be working on helping people express their emotions, helping children know what their emotions are, um, and giving voice to feelings that might be more difficult to express through words than through music. Sometimes it's also just feeling those emotions. Social, so we're bringing people together in a pleasing, meaningful engagement that, again, has this purpose in music. Communicative. Here we're working on helping people verbalize and communicate. So whether that's working on musculature as someone that may be recovering from some type of a, a disability or a disease um, and articulating more clearly, or as I'm sure some of you saw the videos with Gabby Gifford after her brain injury, helping actually create, uh, helping actually get those thoughts into words. Yeah. And so we can use melody and we can use rhythm to do those sorts of things. Sensory. This is looking at different sensory needs when we need to calm our sensory system um, or activate more. And developmental. I did a lot of developmental work at the children's hospital because we had children whose needs were medical but they were pulled away from their normal learning environments. And so we needed to be working on developmental skills. How many people taught their children the alphabet through the ABC song? I still have to do the rhyme about how many days, 30 days, has September, April, June. Still have to do that. That's how I remember. So um, we can learn a lot of skills through music. And then the, the piece that is kind of the final piece. So we've got music therapy, evidence-based practice, musical interventions to meet goals in a therapeutic relationship. So here I am many years ago with a client in the infusion suite. And um, so we're looking for musicians first. We are live musicians. Our degree lies within the school of music. Um, we also are committed. We, we have to respect confidentiality. We're very empathetic, flexible, and creative. We use our music flexibly. Uh, we have to also be self-starters. We have to be able to lead and take some authority and great problem solvers who can dig into what's going on in human behavior and figure out how we can help that. 
with self-awareness, self-care, um, and cultural sensitivity. We are credentialed. So I, uh, all of our students complete a degree in music therapy, a six-month internship at an approved site where they work with a mentor, a music therapist, who uh, is either in affiliation with our university or through our national association. They accumulate 1,200 clinical hours. It's a lot of hours. In practicum, about 200 as students here, and then up to 1,000 in their internship. They must pass the board certification exam, receive the designation of MTBC after passing that exam, and then recertify every three years through continuing education credits or by retaking the exam. So when people used to see me in the elevator with my guitar on my back and they'd say, hey, are you a volunteer? <laughs> no, we are not volunteers. We are uh, highly trained professionals. So there are many routes to getting uh, to the MTBC. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in music therapy and I went out and worked for 30, probably 25 years before I went back for my master's degree. What I'm seeing now is we have a lot of equivalency students. So we have a lot of students who have a bachelor's in music and then they come back and do the equivalency program often with the master's because they can, it's, it's a degree uh, seeking program then, and they can qualify for financial aid. Um, so they're either doing the equivalency alone, which is three semesters, or they're doing it with a master's degree, taking the exam and then getting their MTBC. We, we do also have students who come back who are already board certified moving on to their master's or doctoral level. Our program is uh, approved by the American Music Therapy Association. Our students have to be accepted by audition into the School of Music. This would be um, primarily our undergrads. Um, they then have to pass the orientation of music therapy course and then maintain a B minus or higher in all their other core music therapy courses with a GPA of 3.0 required. When they become seniors, they can either do a, um, a performance track where, excuse me, they are doing a senior recital, which is very performance-based, or if they are more interested in the clinical end, they can do a research project. There are our lovely people. So we're we're a moderate size program, I would say. Um, here you'll see our undergrads, our graduate students, our equivalency students, some of them who are out in um, their internships this semester. I have actually my biggest group so far. I have eight students out right now on internship um, this semester. And you'll see our faculty. I'm in the back right. Abby Dvorak uh, to my left on the right side there. And uh, where's Hey Sun? Over on the left, Hey Sun Kim is our third faculty member in the gray with the beautiful scarf. So I set up all the clinical um, sites for my students, and we have them out in a number of places. So you can read this and see. Currently, we have students serving the UI Reach program, which is a program for young adults um, with intellectual disabilities or on the autism spectrum who are here at Iowa getting a, in a certificate program. Fabulous program. Um, we have a student out at the Chatham Oaks Residential Center. Um, we have two students serving the children's hospital right now with a school age group. We have a student at Briarwood um, Adult Center, um, a healthcare center, excuse me, under rehabilitation there. We often have students at Oak Knoll and I have an intern there now. So we're in lots of different places. And this semester actually for our preschool site, we're serving the Little Angels site at the uh, First United Methodist Church. So a little bit about our faculty. Some of you may know of Kate Gefeller. She's our emeritus uh, faculty with over, over 30 years of faculty experience. She is my mentor, my teacher. Um, and she, for many years, did very much uh, fantastic research in cochlear implant users' perception of music. She has uh, worked in this program for many years, has many NIH grants, and has traveled around the world to speak about this. So, um, yeah, so you can see a little bit about us, who we are. So let's talk a little bit about music therapy in action. That's what you want to hear about, right? So uh, the University Hospitals is, of course, where I spent uh, much of my time. This is our current team over at UIHC. In addition to that, they have three part-time or PRN staff. I'm one. Uh, uh, Mackenzie, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on her last name. Mackenzie is another. And Cecily Vance is their third uh, part-time parent. So they actually have six people now serving over there. The primary areas that they serve are adult supportive and palliative care, 
inpatient psychiatric from child psych through uh, adult psych into med psych and um, geriatric services, as well as outpatient. So pretty extensive there. Pediatrics, including the NICU. Oh, there's Mackenzie Hunt. There we go. Uh, the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit and then general peds, which was my area. So this is Adam on the, on the left, Becca and Katie. So I would love to take a minute to show you a video so you can kind of see what this looks like. I'm wondering about sound. So will someone tell me if you can't hear this? Yes. Okay. When you look at the definition of music therapy, um, we look at music therapy being the therapeutic use of musical interventions to uh, help uh, the the growth or the maintenance of skills in an individual within a therapeutic relationship with a board certified music therapist. We're using the music for specific goals and objectives within a therapeutic relationship. Whoops, sorry. I was trying to click through that. When you look at the definition of music therapy, um, we look at music therapy being the therapeutic use of musical interventions to uh, help uh, the, the growth or the maintenance of skills in an individual within a therapeutic relationship with a board certified music therapist. We're using the music for specific goals and objectives within a therapeutic relationship. We do a lot of singing. Uh, with child singing, if they're able, it definitely builds their respiratory strength when they're singing and deep breathing. Um, I love playing instruments with them, teaching them to play instruments, guitars. We bring in rhythm instruments and drums. What I think really is the most um, powerful for me as a therapist is when I go to see a patient and they're really down and they're really non-responsive um, and the music starts and there's just that spark. And there's that moment where you have that connection um, because of the relationship, but also because of the medium that we're using of music. Well, I it a little bit stronger. It does make you a little bit stronger. Every time you go through something tough, mm -hmm. does it make you stronger? Yeah. Yeah. You one tough girl then, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For about five years so now, I've been specifically working with the teens who have spinal fusion surgery here at the hospital. I'm just going to have you begin by taking some deep breaths. I feel like you're sniffing something that smells really good. It was uh, begun through nursing saying we really need some additional help for some of our kids who are experiencing post-operative discomfort. Raise your pain right now. Still about the same? Hold it. I go and see them on the second day after their surgery and support them when they're up in the chair, providing relaxation training, music-assisted relaxation, and uh, presence with them while they're sitting up. <laughs> We know that coping is an active endeavor. It's not something passive. So we're giving children ways to have mastery, things that they can have control over and to develop their autonomy. So they're not helpless and they're not just fearfully waiting for the next thing that's going to happen to them, but they're actually taking control of their environment. And you've seen some children like that who they come here and they own it. Uh, and we love that. Uh, we want them to be actively engaged. <laughs> nice work on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I know that on my iPod. Do you really? And I sing it to myself. You sing it to yourself? Yeah. Oh, you're muted. 
just real just FYI. Thank you. I hope you were able to hear that okay. Yeah, we heard the video. The video was on. Right. Okay. So as you can see in that video, um, there's a, a lot of different applications of music in the hospital. And um, I thought one way I could kind of summarize it for you is to sort of uh, look at the theory that we base our work upon, and that's the biopsychosocial theory. Um, and this is particularly related to how I looked at pain management. Um, and so here we're looking at the function of the individual socially, um, biologically, the extent of the injury, the nervous system, development, the age, the development, and, and psychologically. So what is mood, learned behaviors, thoughts? What is the per personality of the individual? Because this can really can apply to all ages. Um, and all of these things come together to um, create the, the distress response that they might have or the strong coping response that they might have. And so I work, uh, and many medical music therapists work within this design. So uh, I start at the beginning, right? We'll start with the infants. So infants, hospitalized infants, um, we have many different goals with them, uh, but music is something that we naturally use with, with babies. And it has been used for many, many uh, <laughs> centuries. And it is in every culture uh, that mothers are singing to their children. And so what we find though, is that sometimes when it's a hospitalized situation, we need to kind of help with that. And so we often are working on infant parent bonding, coaching the parent to sing to the child, um, even though the child might be um, unable to be held at a certain time or particularly in the NICU, if they're very, very small, we have to use very specific parameters for how loud or how complicated the music is based on what they can take in and understand. Um, but we can create CDs with the mother's voice. We can, um, or, or whatever it would be now, you know, we record their voice, a, vo a voice recording that we can have at bedside for when the parent is gone. So the infant can hear that voice and encouraging development through the interaction between the parent and fathers are very much engaged in this as well. It's just more of the research is about mother's voice. Um, uh, to use their voice to engage with the baby. And what we find is that um, this can create the, the bonding that is very important for infants. And it also um, can promote their, their development um, and their engagement. So Shanna Delatoile did a study in 2006 where she looked at infant-directed singing, which is what we call the purposeful use of quiet, usually unaccompanied singing with an infant, Lullabies are defined as being slow with sustained phrases. The intent is to soothe and to promote emotional attachment. And so you can find many different response. Well, I'm sure some of you have seen the way infants will look at, they will gaze at the person who's singing to them. Um, and we do see the autonomic nervous system calming and we see heart rates go down in the hospital. I often saw um, oxygen saturation levels going up because the breathing was more effective. Play songs, however, are used for engagement and interaction. Their intent is to gain the child's attention and to promote language and social interaction through repetitive and rhythmic types of songs. So think of, um, oh my goodness, y'all, you know, patty cake, patty cake, baker's man, um, all the little play songs that we use with children. They, they all have ways that they can be used to promote development. And many times, I would find that the stress of the hospital made it difficult for people to kind of have these natural sorts of interactions. And so that's why it was even more important. But I'm seeing this outside of hospitals as well uh, with helping new parents learn to bond and be with their children um, and to um, use their own voices. Because people are very, so streaming is great. Like I said, it's really expanding how people find music. But I also find that we're getting away from making our own music and people get very self-conscious about their voices. And so many times it's helping encourage them to use their voices. So with pain management, this was my area of, um, of particular interest. I found that there were children in the hospital experiencing pain that oftentimes medication didn't um, resolve. And what I often found with children, and I'm sure it's present in adults as well, is that there is distress related to pain. And the distress is oftentimes not ad addressed by the medication. So um, 
What, what we know from research um, is that pleasant music reduces pain perception. So this is music that we find pleasant. So when you think about all that music that you identified at the beginning as your favorite, you have to have a positive emotional balance when you listen to this music. Chills are great. That's going to be the best. But a positive um, reaction, that music is what will be helpful to you. Unpleasant music that you find unpleasant, that music you're like, oh, I really don't want to listen to that. It's not going to make it worse, but it's not going to have much effect. So that's where preference comes in with music therapists. We want to use music that's preferred. Um, in a systematic review, uh, they did find that there were positive effects of music on reducing anxiety and pain in 50% of studies. Now, this was a nursing study in which they offered um, individuals certain playlists that they could listen to. And there was not a therapist involved um, who was actually designing specific music. So half the time it worked, half the time it didn't in that case. With children, we have lots of myths that still go around about children in pain. And so we are afraid to use opioids with them. Sometimes we're, we're, we sometimes think that they'll get used to the pain or that they don't feel pain or they can't really reliably express their pain. Or if they don't seem to be in a lot of pain, then they probably aren't feeling it. Um, we know that these are myths and that um, we need to move forward and do better with, with um, treating pain in children. So my desire was to um, provide music assisted relaxation, as you saw in that video, to help lower pain. Um, in this study, we see that it has been shown to decrease pain with adults. Um, and these are adults in palliative care. So music assisted relaxation is just that quiet music that you saw me using paired with relaxation, uh, verbal direction. We look at pain scores to determine the effectiveness of the intervention. And so we're looking at numeric pain rating, that's zero to 10, as well as a functional pain scale, which is sort of the emotional end of it. How, do you feel like you can deal with it? They might say, well, my pain's a seven, but I'm okay. Or they might say my pain's a five and I can't handle it today. So the functional pain scale gets to that piece of it. So what we did is we worked with adolescents who had spinal fusion surgery and provided um, music assisted relaxation and preferred music. Um, in this design, it was in the second day after their surgery when they got up with physical therapy. So anybody who's had physical therapy, you know, that's not always the most pleasant thing. And so what we did is once they got back and finished with their physical therapy, they were required to sit up in a chair, as you see here, and the music therapist provided companionship through the music and the guidance of with relaxation for them. Um, and we did see a significant decrease in pain and anxiety from the beginning to the end. So we looked at primarily female patients, ages 10 to 19. In this design, actually half of them were seeing a preoperative video and half of them were not. And then they were all getting the music therapy because we felt it was very important for them to all have the service since we were in a clinical setting. So um, as you can see, um, primarily females enrolled in this, which are, that's indicative of the surgery, main age around 14. So we have individuals, adolescents who are usually in this case have not been um, in the hospital much. And as you can see here, their, um, their mean pain score before uh, the intervention was about seven and a half and about 5.2 after. So our experimental group are the ones who saw the video ahead of time and the control are the ones who did not see the video ahead of time. But again, everyone received music. And you saw the scores for stress go down from um, six to 3.5, pretty significant there. The pain went from 7.7 .7 to 5.2. Anything over seven we consider to be very severe pain. So here are the changes that we saw. We did not see that the preoperative video, the training video was effective. It was just as effective to go in without them knowing anything about it and just provide the service. So overall, the music therapy was effective in helping them decrease stress and anxiety. And we think about all the money that goes into pharmaceuticals and all the problems we have with opioids for pain management, anything we can do to help address those needs um, are very important. Palliative care and hospice care is another uh, area where music therapists work quite a bit. Palliative care, oftentimes you see in the hospital, um, it's often institution-based, can begin at diagnosis if it's a severe diagnosis, and throughout the course of treatment, often offered alongside curative and palliative care is simply the uh, remedia, a very strong focus on the remediation of symptoms. So um, 
people often think palliative care and hospice are the same. Hospice care begins within um, six months uh, when, when a physician would say that there is six months or, or less to live and will support individuals through the dying process. And on um, both of these, uh, a lot of care goes to the families. So um, a review of 11 studies, um, I think we'll see the bottom of my slides, I believe this is the Kraut study, um, showed that uh, music therapy was able to positively affect pain, physical comfort, fatigue, anxiety, time and duration of treatment, mood, spirituality, very big area of work, quality of life, big area of work, and again, working with families. Um, so, oh, here's our crowd study. Yeah. End of life care. Uh, he, Robert looked at 80 adults in hospice and, um, QOL was the quality of life uh, rating. So they had a tool they used for that. Um, and they found that quality of life remained high, even as physical health declined. So therefore the live music therapy was beneficial for patients with terminal illness and, um, the effect improved with frequency. So, that was a study by Hilliard, I'm so sorry, in 2003. Kraut looked also at 80 adults and uh, found that there was significant change in the same areas. So music therapy with hospice and palliative care, end-of-life care is a, is a very common intervention. You'll see a lot of music therapy in that area. So with adults, we use a lot of music listening, song choice, singing, musical life review, guided imagery and music, lyric analysis, um, active music making, that's AMM, and relaxation. So when we look at, at more of the um, effects of music therapy and palliative medicine, we see another study here that um, again, looks at the symptoms of anxiety, depression, pain, shortness of breath and mood and saw positive effects. Some of the faces of pediatric palliative care. This was a big area where I worked. I worked with a number of children at the hospital. Um, and in my work there, um, I found that it was, it was very beneficial to the families. I was able to support parents and children and, um, siblings, um, through a, what would many would consider one of the most difficult periods of their life. So music, uh, oftentimes this forward can improve that quality of life also for the family. Um, and it can help improve the child's physical state. It can give them opportunities to have this uh, typical interaction with family members that they would see in their normal life. Um, so we're working on positive coping, um, giving children self-expression, choice and control. And what this looks like, is singing preferred songs, getting children involved in playing if they're able to, bringing family to um, ar around uh, and together because so many times I'd go in and parents are doing one thing and sibling was doing another thing and the child was doing another thing and bringing them together in music making that was meaningful and purposeful um, with the child choosing maybe I want so-and-so to play this instrument and that instrument and this is the song that I want to hear today when they were able to be that engaged was very very helpful and this developed this um, these family moments where we then could um, partner with them and be with them supporting um, as the child's illness progressed. I did a lot of legacy creation, video creation, songwriting, voice recordings. And here you see again, some of the information about the different types of interventions that we do. So I'm looking at the time um, and I know that my, uh, my friend Sanju Lee will be joining soon. So I'm just gonna give you a little uh, introduction into neurologic rehab. I feel like that was just a whole lot of information that I just gave you about medical and pain management. Um, medical music therapy is kind of a whole area to itself, but what we find is that music is also being used in a lot of rehabilitative, specifically rehabilitative ways. So this might be in a hospital, but it also might be in a rehab facility. It could be with people of all different ages. And here we're looking at using the elements of music. So rhythm, right? And melody and force of music to uh, promote certain physical behaviors um, and cognitive behaviors. So NMT is a very specific type of music therapy that requires additional training. Um, and with these techniques, we are able to 
have a more brain-based approach to what we're doing with individuals. So for example, um, gait training. Gait training is an area that I actually have a video I'd love to show you, um, where we um, use the rhythm of music to help people move more effectively. So let me just show you a little bit of what this looks like, because I know Sunju will talk to you about speech and language. Let's see if we can link into this. Here we go. So George was a, a man in his early 50s who had suffered a stroke to his cerebellum, which left him with some severe uh, movement uh, problems. And when I met him was in a physical therapy session, working with the physical therapist in co-treatment. And we initially met him, he could walk about 40 feet at a very rigid and slow pace of approximately 65 beats per minute. And he was also using a cane. It had taken him about three weeks of physical therapy of five or six days per week for an hour per session. So a total of between 15 and 20 hours of physical therapy to get him to where we were um, and where I met him on that first day. We uh, did what's called rhythmic auditory stimulation, which is using rhythm to help with movement. And within one 45 minute session, he was able to walk twice as fast without a cane. So we actually were able to remove the cane from the situation. He took longer steps and he was able to walk nearly five times as far as he did when I first met him. And that was in one 45 minute session. Yeah, one more speed, you know. We're talking okay. All right. It's pretty significant change, huh? So what we see is that by locking into the rhythm, and using music very specifically and intentionally, um, we can see great improvement in people's skills and abilities. Um, so I understand that Sunju Lee has joined our Zoom. Is that correct? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. So um, are you a co-host so you could share your slides now? Let's see. No, I I'll not. go ahead and I'll make you a comment. So oh, I'm going to stop my share at this point. We were, we are going to have time for questions um, after Sunju presents. This is perfect hand up. Perfect timing, Sunju. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You should be a co-host now. Cool. So I'd like to introduce to you Sunju Lee, who is a master of music, MTBC and an NMT fellow. Uh, she is one of our doctoral candidates and a teaching assistant in music therapy. She also serves as director of Tremble Clefts, Arizona and Iowa, choirs for individuals with Parkinson's disease, their care partners and family members, as well as she works with Sunshine Music Therapy, her private business. She is interested in using therapeutic group singing as music therapy interventions to address various needs in individuals with neurologic disease and developmental delays. She believes that singing is an avenue to connect people, enabling them to meet at their own level of functioning, fostering meaningful relationships. Please help me welcome Sunju. Thank you so much, Professor Nelson, for having me today. Good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Sanju Lee. I am a PhD candidate in music therapy at the University of Iowa. First, uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about my clinical practice and research about tremble clefs acquired for people with Parkinson's caregivers and their family members. So let me begin the presentation by sharing some quotes from the singers in tremble claps. You can live in your own little world. You will go down with no vision, sing, and look to have fun. You don't do that when you're all alone. Mary Robinson. Mary joined tremble claps when she first diagnosed with PD in 2012. And she sang with the group more than six years. As a professional singer, losing her voice for singing and speaking from PD, Parkinson's, was a very challenging thing for her. However, since she joined the group, she regained her ability to sing and served as the soloist of the group until she passed away in 2019. In this quote, she talks about using singing as a tool to overcome some difficulties living with PD. I would love to see Tremble Clap become available to everyone with PD in the US. Personally, when I see the impact that singing has on our group, I am deeply moved and impressed by the difference it makes in our lives. Kirk Hall. Kirk is a singer of Tremble Clap and he's a power blogger, researcher, and P PD, Parkinson's advocate. He's been diagnosed with PD more than 10 years. In this quote, he talks about the use of therapeutic group singing to enhance the overall quality of people with Parkinson's disease. So what is Parkinson's disease? Let me briefly talk about it. When you see the slide, you see the green highlighted portion of the brain, which is called basal ganglia. Basal ganglia plays an important role to control automatic movement. In basal ganglia, there is an, another area called substantia nigra. Substantia nigra means black substance in Latin, and it produces dopaminergic neurons in our brain. The loss of dopamine is known to develop several symptoms in Parkinson's disease. However, People are diagnosed with PD when they are already lost 50 to 80% of the dopaminergic neurons in basal ganglia, ganglia. The loss of dopaminergic neuron develop various kinds of symptoms in PD. First, motor symptoms affect mobility that limit the functional ability, such as activities for daily living. Also, those challenges with mobility negatively impact psychological function in PD, such as depression and anxiety, leading to decrease the overall quality of the people with Parkinson's disease. Particularly, the voice and speech related symptoms are considered as one of the most challenging aspects of living with Parkinson's disease. For example, the patient with PD experience, they reduce the volume of speech, which means their volume of speech gets softer. So people have a hard time to understand what they're saying. And also they have experienced slurred speech and monotone, which means there is no ups and downs over their speaking voice and voice weaknesses and they experience hoarse voice and strained voice and swallowing problems. The swallowing problem is one of the causes of the death in PD. The particles from the food and drink pills go, goes, go down to the digestive system. I'm sorry, so the food and the drinks and some uh, particles from the pill go down to the trachea instead of their digestive system, and then it stays in their lungs and it causes aspiration pneumonia. So aspiration pneumonia is one of the causes of the death in, uh, in Parkinson's disease. 
and also the traditional therapies such as medication, speech, and physical therapy, and even exercise are used to treat several symptoms in Parkinson's disease. Additionally, recent research have indicated the effectiveness of singing, particularly group singing, as the therapeutic intervention to address specific symptoms in Parkinson's disease. So now let me talk about tremble claps. Tremble claps is a therapeutic singing group for people with Parkinson's, caregivers, and their family members. Tremble Clef is the first therapeutic singing group for PD in the US, and this group is established in 1994. Last year, I had a chance to conduct historical research of Tremble Clefs, and I got to learn the group of people with PD and their caregivers in one of the local Parkinson's support group in Arizona founded this therapy singing group with the discovery that despite the speech impairment, people with PD can still sing. And even after singing, they can make their speech voice better so that they decide to choose singing as a way for speech therapy. And as you know, singing is fun. So myself, I have been uh, serving as a director of Tremble Club since 2008. Currently, Tremble Class provide in-person and online therapeutic programs locally, globally, as a nonprofit organization. Since COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, uh, we are able to use the online platform. So now we are serving uh, people from England and Canada on a weekly basis. In Tremble Clefts, we have specific areas that we want to achieve. First, we're aiming to maintain and enhance vocal and physical functions. Also, we're aiming to increase the public awareness of PD through the active community engagement, such as public concert. We're aiming to promote social interactions and communication within the PD community by providing support for care partners and patients in order to improve the overall quality of life for people with Parkinson's disease and their caregiver, caregivers. Particularly, as a way to promote the public awareness of PD, we actively engage with the communities. We provide concert to the communities like, like senior centers, other state care center, senior living communities, and PD supports group. Sometimes we're invited as the entertainers, and we also get some uh, get paid for these performances, especially for Parkinson's fundraisers and a conference. When you see the slide uh, on your right side, there are two pictures of the group singing the national anthem for one of the uh, major baseball game in Phoenix, Arizona in 2014 and 2019. In fact, we auditioned to get this opportunity and then we were invited uh, two times in our history. So our members are very proud of the fact that we're able to out there to increase the public awareness of Parkinson's disease. And also in that way, we are able to recruit more singers with PD. The clinic experiences as a music therapist of Tremble Clefs has profoundly inspired me to pursue my PhD in music therapy and expand my passion for research. Since I have studied in the University of Iowa, I have published two articles about the effectiveness of therapeutic singing for individuals with Parkinson's disease. And most importantly, I was able to start Tremble Club in Iowa City, Iowa last October, and I continue to strive serving this population. So that's the flyer of Tremble Club in Iowa. Iowa City. We're meeting every Monday from 1030 to 12 at Iowa City Senior Center. If you do anybody who has Parkinson's disease, 
they can join with their family members and their friends uh, to this group. Now I would like to uh, share uh, some uh, videos of, uh, of showing you how therapy singing can be applied in the group setting for people with Parkinson's disease. This is a video of John with PD. He joined Tremble Claps due to his voice loss. After participating in group sessions and several individual sessions, he decided to sing a solo for one of Tremble Clap concert. Good afternoon. <laughs> Fast forward for time sake. Here we go. of his voice you can really imagine once he has lost his voice because of parkinson's disease and now let me stop sh uh, sharing Just give me a second this slide and i am going to show you another video sorry not this one So when we were invited to, do you see the screen, Kirsten? Do I you... do. I see a chat box in front of it. Okay, just give me a second. Maybe that's me. Okay, that might be me. <laughs> I saw it. I saw Is your screen. You? Okay. Okay. I saw the screen. I saw the screen fine. I didn't okay. see the chat box. Okay, great. Go Is for it. it. Now? Yes. Looks good. Okay. Do you see the video? Yep. Okay. So when we were invited to sing uh, the national anthem uh, for the baseball game in 2019, I wanted to have a special moment for the groups to experience by making a video to show our journey of preparing this event. So let me start to play this one. I've always had music in my life. I've sung since I was about three years old. I did. Oh. I did my first solo in second grade. So I love music. But when I lost my voice, I didn't know what happened. So, and um, then I was diagnosed with Parkinson's 15 years ago. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2009. My voice had deteriorated enough uh, five years after being diagnosed with Parkinson's that I thought I'd better try out tremble clefts and, and see what that could do for me. And it's been fantastic what it did for me. It did, only took about three months to regain my voice. And uh, I've really enjoyed singing since. Parkinson's is degenerative disease. It's all downhill. There's no uphill and uh, it's easy to withdraw and stay home. We're here at Chase Field today to do the uh, Star Spangled Banner before the game, which is very exciting. We kind of feel like movie stars. The Arizona Diamondbacks and the Pittsburgh Pirates invite you to join in the singing of the Star Spangled Banner performed by the Tremble Clefts. Trumbo Clefts is a choral group providing music therapy for people with Parkinson's disease. 
these singers fight Parkinson's with vocal exercise and a spirit of joy. Please welcome director Sunju Lee and the Tremble Clefs. and gentlemen, the Tremble Clefs. Okay, so that's what we do in, uh, in Tremble Clefs. So if you have any questions, that's all I got. <laughs> I love it, Sunju. Thank you. That was beautiful. Just beautiful. Yeah, I, uh, at this point, we're welcome. Uh, you're, you're welcome to ask your questions. We are here to answer um, anything that has come up during this presentation. I know we've covered a, a lot of material. Okay, I'm going to leave my video off because I'm definitely a little misty. So <laughs> I appreciate you guys sharing that, but I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording before we get to the Q&A part.